In the previous issue of HP Solve, I wrote an article about measuring calculator current. I used the HP 41 as an example, and I gave four typical measured values, and I explained why I picked those four and what they mean and so forth. This is part two. Pretty much what you see here will appear in the next issue, which I will put together as soon as I get home. And this might be part two of that article. I picked nine examples from the 24 current models. And I'll talk about the, the method, the data, four states, and analysis. And I'll go through this and describe it. And then I, I, uh, I've got a demonstration set up here. And uh, we'll, I, there's just one particular aspect of doing this that I want, I want you to actually see how, how it goes. Uh, We haven't changed anything, but I know this works. Okay. Okay, one day you pick up your calculator, you turn it on, and you get a blank display. Now, in the old days, uh, we actually had on off switches, and calculators were designed quite a bit differently than they are today. And now what? What do you do if you got a blank display? Cost. Huh? Cost. Well, that's the first thing, I suppose. Yeah, away, you you the the next thing, batteries. The next the thing you're going to do is check your batteries. Look for the on switch. Well, we assume you're familiar with this calculator. Oh, okay. so it's, <laughs> your, it's your calculator. It's not somebody who's brought it to you for repair. And uh, the batteries are known to be good. So if you're going to attempt to troubleshoot the machine, oh, I keep that up. We have to know a little bit about electricity and electronics in order to do that. <laughs> so the beginning, the most important part of all electronic devices is Ohm's law. And this applies for DC and under special conditions AC. And I'm going to differentiate DC from AC, AC meaning the digital signals and pulses and the ones and zeros that you study to know all about. We are not going to attempt to troubleshoot, diagnose our calculator by doing digital and signal analysis on it. That's beyond all of us here and the equipment required. Now, with regards to this, I'm going to tell a little story. Years ago uh, in Asia, I was taking a tour through an, uh, an IC packaging plant. You have a typical plant with all the equipment and, and specialized uh, things and and what they what they did uh, primarily for national semiconductor was to take integrated circuits uh, which what in, in the popular language is called a chip I cringe every time I hear that word chip because it just means nothing at all it's a generalized I have a disease well doctor can you be a little more specific you know it's a broad sweeping term you're sick so an integrated circuit is that little piece of silicon with all this circuitry on them. And that's what they were doing. They were, they were putting these in the plastic cases and they're just you know, streaming out. And I noticed this big machine that obviously was meant to be used, but it wasn't being used. And I said, well, what is that? He says, that's our digital uh, testing machine. And of course, it's computer based. And, and when you start getting logic gates, you have all these states and technically, if you're going to test them, you want to, you need to test all the states, which all the states is probably more states than you'll even count in your lifetime. I don't know you can think about testing it, but, but the particular important points of the logic of the, of, of the integrated circuit, uh, you, can, you can check that. I said, well, why aren't you using it? He says, well, we've discovered that with all the complexity of those circuits and all the testing we could do, which took minutes in some cases, if we simply measured what's called the quiescent current being drawn by that integrated circuit, it tells us almost everything we need to know for, for us to do our job. Our job is build them, test them, accept, reject, accept, reject. That's all. Okay. And so what they will simply do is measure the current drawn by that integrated circuit. And it's called quiescent current. And that's what we're going to do with our calculator. Now, in order to do that, we need uh, an instrument, a piece of equipment. You don't have to be an electronics engineer, even an amateur radio. You don't need to. 
a lot of technical knowledge in order to do this, and that's my whole point of presenting this, I'll give you some perspective on it. Now, I just grabbed some meters out of my drawer, and um, there are various kinds, very, they, run every, they run everything from zero to $120, are the ones on this thing. The cost of these machines range from zero to about $120. And I'll talk about the zero machine part of this talk. Now, if we're going to make measurements, we all know that a meter has probes in it. We stick them somewhere and we, we, we make measurements. Voltage is the most common measurement you make. And if your batteries are dead, you might want to test them. So you take your two things and you put, you know, if it's a six volt battery, you pick a range that will be <coughs> six or above. And you take and you put the plus to the plus, the minus to minus, as was shown over here. And you check the voltage, of course. Doing that on a battery is, doesn't tell you a whole lot. You should use a battery checker, and what that does is it has a, a resistor across the voltmeter to guarantee that you're going to draw a certain amount of current. That's what a battery tester, and you buy those are ready to check inexpensively as well. But if you're going to measure the current, you have to break the circuit and put the meter in line to measure the current going through the calculator. Now that's where life becomes more difficult. And in part one of the article, how many people read that article? Anybody read it? Okay. Well, maybe I'll read <coughs> a little bit, but I don't spend time on that. The mechanical part of, of interrupting the circuit and putting the meter in there is, is, is the hard part of it. All the analysis and interpretation of the results is also part of it. But that's the, that is the difficult part. And the difficult part is that uh, many meters, if you exceed their ratings, they go pop and they don't work anymore. So if you're going to measure you know, an ampere and you put it on a microampere range, pop, it doesn't work anymore. So not only do you have to break the circuit, you have to have your head engaged and, and coordinate with your hands on, on what you're doing so that you don't blow your fuse, which is what the pop is. So it's a mechanical issue more than it is an electrical issue. Now I mentioned the two different parts here, our DC part that we're going to address, and the AC part, which are digital circuits, that the clocks are, you know, at the megahertz range, and that means that each little pulse is, you know, in the sub-microseconds in duration. And humans respond in low milliseconds in duration, you know, that's a thousand to one ratios there. And and uh, the digital circuits are, are, are extremely fast so that circuit designers will shut down the circuits when not needed. And if you think about it, it's quite interesting. Um, uh, I worked in biomedical electronics and we, we, we developed uh, injectable, implantable devices into the human body. So aside from all the medical issues involved, we have uh, when you're going to inject something into a human body, you've got to be very careful what you put in the body, how long you leave it there, and how you take it out, if you take it out. Sometimes you leave it in because the risks are greater taking it out than just leaving it in. <coughs> and so power consumption becomes very, very important. And uh, of course, in the case of the calculator, we have various circuits that take various amounts of power. And if it's not needed, why not shut it down? You're not, you're not burning up your battery if it's turned off. And if you turn it on for a, a millisecond, turn it off again, you've got a low duty cycle. You get a long battery life by shutting it off when you don't need it. Of course, you have to decide what are the conditions of not needing it and so on. And of course, in the case of a calculator, the LCDs tend to be the primary current uses, especially the large ones. And I remember doing demonstrations many years ago. I hold an LCD display in my hand. I have the, the connections pre-connected. I hold it in my hand and I walk across the carpet and I light up the, the LCD. That was a mind-boggling. My gosh, the current is so, the electrostatic charge is enough to make my just, boy, is that small current. And, and it was, it really was. Now here's the current lineup of an HP. Um, they're divided into three categories, financial calculators, scientific graphing, and home and office. The home and office is a relatively new category. 
and they have model numbers that we're probably not too familiar with. But what I did was to select three in each of the columns, so I measured nine calculators, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, somewhat controversial aspect is on this table, the 30B and the 20B I have underlined, and down here it says, uh, uh, note, programmable calculators are in blue, underlined models are at or near end of life. Of course, I don't know <laughs> when end of life is, and I suspect that HP doesn't really either because they don't formalize that whole process and they don't say, okay, we've announced this machine, now we've unannounced this machine, it's, it's no longer available. But each machine has a product plan. Uh, I don't think there's anything more in there, it's worth while here. So if we're going to measure a calculator, and if the designers of the calculator are trying to keep the current down, and they're turning it on and off all the time, so fast that you know, you, you, human beings couldn't even keep track of it without special instrumentation, especially oscilloscopes and other instruments. We can measure it with a meter, such as this one here, this is what I picked on. This is the meter that, that, that I'm using for this purpose. This is my zero cost meter. <coughs> and uh, there are four states. Now, one of these states is less relevant to date, and you only discover that by having some data, and then you notice, wow, HP is really improving their stuff, you know. First one is the off state. And you tend to think that when, when the machine is off, you tend to think it's off. But modern machines are not off. Modern TV sets are not off. You can't turn them off. If you pull the cord, you get them off. And the reason for that is because we want to be in control of these devices. Well, if we want to control them, we need to talk to them. And if we're going to talk to a machine, it has to be under power. And so that's the problem. You're a little remote control on your TV. It's always listening, looking for that infrared pulse to tell it to do something, 24-7. And in fact, we have the STAR uh, energy uh, regulations or rule guidelines or whatever you want to call them that are continuously asking the manufacturers to reduce that standby, they call it, uh, I forgot the term they use now, but they have a, you know, the press is dubbed it with a kind of a negative term that they call it, uh, that's really wasting power. Now we're going to turn it on, and we're going to press the on key. Now back in the old days, the classic series machines, they actually had, if you look up here in, in, in this demonstration up here with the classic machines, they have a slide on off switch. It really meant, Here's my circuit, slide it over, make contact, current can flow. It was a true on-off switch. The switches to these lights are true on-off switch. True on-off power switches are becoming almost gone in everything, in your car. No longer do we have actual mechanical switches because everything's electronically controlled. Now once you turn it on, we're ready to calculate. And then, of course, if we're going to run the calculator, it's running. These are four separate basic states that kind of apply to almost every calculator. And you can measure these numbers, and the numbers are what's important here. And that's what I'm going to talk about. In order to do this, I made a little uh, test fixture, simply a box. This is a switch, on-off switch. It's uh, spring-loaded. You press it down to open it. So it's just like this. You press it down, and it opens. And these are identical. The two lines go through here, like that, but they go through the switch here. Now, when you push down on the switch and opens it up, the current may divert through this resistor. This is a one ohm resistor. So we put a low value resistor. It's on your hard drive, Roger. <laughs> Shoot all you want, but I'm just telling you, you get the whole force quality on your uh, uh, ACC drive. The reason we have the switch is what I'll demonstrate at the end here. These two pin jacks here are for my meter, and I have the meter connected to it. And so the switch is closed, and the, the problem with making these measurements for those people who are not experienced or, or sensitive to the, to the issues involved is that whenever you measure something, you're going to change it. And any time you put an instrument into a circuit in any way, you are going to take something from that circuit. Even though it is very small, it still alters the circuit. And modern day circuits are so low 
current drain devices that the instrumentation is now approaching the magnitude of that and it, it becomes a problem. The Heisenberg principle. Well, yeah, but the, you got to go off off the horizon to get into that area. But so here it is, the test setup, and it's almost the same thing I got connected here. I have these pin jacks. I have uh, some uh, what's called easy hook if you buy them from one manufacturer, and it's got a little hook like that, and you, you press it down, and it goes up, and then it goes down, and it, it wraps around whatever you're trying to connect to, and they're small. I use a, a double C cell holder. The C cells have a lot of capacity, so I can use it for quite a while, even before the voltage even shows signs of, you know, kind of dropping off with age. And here's my zero cost meter. And so, what I've done now, in part one of the article, I described some techniques for inserting a little insulator with a metal contact between the contacts of the battery and the battery terminal, and divert the current that way. But these smaller, like coin cell operated batteries. The dimensions are so small that you, you you can't go that pro. So I said, forget that. We're going to run the calculator from an external power supply, and I can do anything I want. And the critical thing are these switches. Now, for my use, you can almost forget that. I had two lines going through here, so I put two switches. One I have a plug. I can put one ohm, point one ohm. I can replace that, and then this is for the normal meter. So here's a typical test setup. And I made this stand so I can have these, these uh, easy hooks in the back of the machine and you can't lay the calculator down because you put the weight on those hooks they're going to pop off. And you, you go crazy in the mechanics of doing this. You've got to have patience. And uh, by making the stand, and I, I, I picked all the models I was going to use that this is big enough and the areas are wherever the batteries are in their cell holders that, that accommodate the leads. So that's the whole point here. Now this particular setup, and, and I have multiple photographs in the paper itself. I, I don't show them all in the, in the proceedings. There's the alkaline C cells, and here I'm using two batteries. Uh, I've got some connections to my terminals on my batteries for a voltmeter is 3.23 volts, and then the current is 20.0 uh, milliampers, and this is a 15C limited edition. So it's running, it's running a program. I just do a simple loop and running it. And the current is 20.0 milliamps. The voltage is 2.23. Multiplying together, you figure out how much power your calculator is actually using. Now, the cell connections are illustrated here. The backs are <coughs> the calculators. These are the three models I picked to measure. And all of them, well, the newer ones, are using a very nice power source. It's called the CR uh, uh, 2032. It's a three volt, um, a three volt lithium battery, and that's the terminal normal terminal voltage of lithium batteries. And there's one here, two each of there. And for the other models, these are the scientific. I didn't take the time to straighten it. This bothers me crazy. I just going to straighten that out. Here we're, we're using uh, AA batteries, and this is, uh, uh, I forgot what that one, that may be the, oh, this is 39G, I put the labels on it, 35S and a 15C. Now, we have two cells here, how they're connected, how they're used, varies from machine to machine. And there's one case I still haven't figured out how, how it's working it. And then these are the office machines. Turns out that the biggest machine in HP's product line uses the smallest battery. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, interesting there. This is the math bar that Jake's kids have made famous in several conferences. <laughs> and you take the, uh, the, you know, the 10 screws off. And by the way, uh, at one of our conferences, we talked to Sam Kim. We said, why didn't you put hex screw, uh, uh, hex in there? That really looked cool. It really be techy, you know. The, and you look at the cost, and there's five to ten times higher in price, and they're hard to find. So you understand very quickly why HP didn't use them. I would suggest if you're taking them apart, and it's not a problem, take them. How many people in this room have a demagnetizer? Nobody, huh? Demagnetizer? Is it an AC or is it, is it just a, a really, really strong magnet? Okay. I would suggest 
You know, if you have a carpet and you drop a screw, one of these very tiny screws into the carpet, it's gone. It's just gone. Now, usually there's steel screws and you get a, mag a magnet and you can find it that way. But in order to handle the screws, I suggest you take a magnet, I got a nice needle dinner magnet, take my screwdriver and you stroke it maybe five times as plain. But I always do the same motion, come in across, come in across, and you magnetize it. Then when you get your screw, you always have your screw with you and you can control it. That's it. It's well worth your time. Now I have a demagnetizer that I built plugged into the wall. And I put my screwdriver in there and I slowly pull it out and it's totally demagnetized. I can magnetize, demagnetize anything I want that way. This is double A for the print count because it's got that printer and paper advance and all that. It takes a lot of power. Now this is a typical coin cell connection. And this is the, you know, the uh, easy hook type connectors you've got to observe polarity. We're talking about DC. Check and double check your polarity. Not all calculators are reverse polarity protected. And the mere fact of just connecting your power externally to the calculator can blow your calculator. Doesn't, doesn't happen too often, but it is possible. So always double check your polarity. Now, this is the results of connecting them up and making the measurements. There's the three models of the finance and the scientific, and then the last three are the office machines. The off state is one of the most important because that's how long you can put it in your desk drawer and come back and expect your machine to still run. If you're drawing a small amount of current, it lasts a long time. Of course, it's relative to the size of the battery. So the lowest off state, 4.2.1 microamps, the 12C Platinum. We all know that the Pioneer series of machines are probably one of the best that HP makes for battery life because they draw so much. Voyager. Hmm? Voyager. Voyager series. Voyager. Voyager. Did I say Pioneer? Yes. Yeah. Wrong series. <laughs> now the on key, wow. the on key is interesting here. The, the keyboard has to be scanned. Row and column alternately scanned continuously so that when you go press the on key, we make the row column connect, the processor says, hey, I know what key has been pressed, turn this calculator on. Now if you look at some of these, the lowest here is the quick calc, the math bar, and it draws 8.8. .8. But look at this one up here, 19,800 microamps, that's 19.8 milliamps of current. That's substantial. And if that calculator is in a student's book backpack and there's a book leaning against that key, guess what? Two days later, all the batteries are dead. Mm, what happened? What, something's wrong? No, you just have to be holding the on key down all the time. So when you get down to the low microamps, that's, that's pretty nice. And of course, the quick calc uh, is the lowest and the 15 CLE, look at that sticker. Very oh, yeah. high. Once we turn it on, the display is on, you're ready to calculate something, and it's just on. You leave it there, don't do anything, it's gonna draw this amount of current, and after 10 minutes, it'll automatically shut off. There, you know, thereabouts, it's fair. So the on, standby on current, well, again, the quick count wins is 2.7. The high end here is well, the 15 CL is 49.4 microamps, and microamps are good, you know. Um, or is 160 up here for the 30B? 264. 264 for 39. Oh, here we go. 39G2. And Tim, jump in anytime you want to why any of these numbers are what they are. Um, and then, of course, running. Now, not all the machines, especially the office machines, they're not programmable. And if you're going to calculate something and it goes so fast, it really, you, you're really not going to see in your meter what the running is. So I put not applicable here on, on these machines. In the case down here with the um, print calc, I don't have a normal running mode, but it might be useful to know that um, uh, this is note number nine, printing paper, printing 145 milliamp, uh, This probably should be, I think this is milliamps, this is an error. 
and 185, the highest range, is when the papers advance. If you want to test a printing calculator, hold the paper advance button down, and that's where you're going to see the highest current that you're going to draw. And here's some comments. I did uh, switch my power supply for the 15, because that happened to be when I thought of it, and I could vary it so I could start off with the three rows and come down, down, down. The normal, old, classical design standard is two thirds. Your battery is gone when the voltage drops one third, and if it's a three volts, you have two volts left, end of life. And when you're testing again, that voltage, knowing some of this information, that voltage gives you a clue, but you should always test a battery under load, always. No load test doesn't give you a whole lot of information. So there's the results of measuring these nine. Any questions? The uh, LE, uh, LE, what? LE uh, um, 15, was it 15CLE uh, looked like Lim it. Limited edition? It was taking more, less power when it's running than it is when it's normally on. Well, well running is, is, is so the next one see, down. I mentioned look at this, and I, I don't want 19,900, what kind of numbers that's? 19.9 milliamps is the way I, I just said that. The next one down. Uh, Here? Next no. one down. Next one. Yeah. 49.4 yeah. on 19.7 running. Yeah, I think that's, that's off by that's three orders of magnitude there. Here? Yeah. Um, Should be 19.7 milliamps. Oh. Well, generally speaking, running is going to be more than on. That's correct. Uh, I'll, I'll have to double check that. Yeah. And uh, I don't have an LE with me. I, I'd use that as my demo to check it out in real time. That might be an error. I'll, I'll try to remember that. Now, if you're going to get involved in the power supply, you might notice that you know your instruction manual will give you a clue. But a lot of machines will have two coin cells in there, and they may be simply connected in parallel. Or they may be connected in parallel, but isolate, have a diode isolation. I won't get into electronics of what that is or what that means. But here's some general information of these things. Um, the business machines are using uh, three volts coin cells. Uh, here's 1.5 volts on the 39G. On a voltage note here, uh, diode isolation allows the two cells to power the circuits in such a way that as long as one cell is present, memory, usually data registers and program memory, will not be erased. So they tell you change one cell at a time, that's the point there, so you preserve your memory. There's still almost always a capacitor that will hold it up for oh, quite, a, quite a long time. There are cell holders. Four cell holders used for the print calc. Those are the four AA cells. How are they connected? The cell holders, they're connected in parallel, parallel. Down here, there's a note with the diode isolation. In the case of 39G2, there are two sets, uh, top and bottom pair, and the, the bottom pair, they are in parallel, uh, but they're, they're isolated between these two, and like I say, I haven't done a lot of studies to figure out why why is that designed that way, and I think it has to do with the processor used and so forth. In this case, they're in series. The print count it actually runs on six volt DC, so all four cells are in series in one, one single supply. You can think of these as two supplies. No. So there's some cell hold, holder information which you should be sensitive to. Now, in order to there's two things that once we know the current we're drawing, there are two things we can use this information for. One is to provide a clue as to what might have happened to my calculator. And two is to estimate battery life. Estimating battery life is a PhD thesis kind of a subject. Right? And, and the reason for that is any complex machine has a very large number of potential states. So it's not a single current on off. It's not that simple. And I got a, a 50 here uh, that Gene loaned me to demonstrate uh, what happens when you're making the measurements. Uh, so when we deal with our biomedical implants, we work with the actual circuit designers. We come up with the important uh, parts to measure so that we measure this, this, and this, and we 
we, we process it some way mathematically to come up with what the, what the average current. So I could put a number on these things and then rank them in order. And so I said, okay, let's take a student use on average, Saturday, Sunday, Monday through Friday, of three times a day. Now you pick up your machine, turn it on, do your calculation, you set it down, you forget, but in 10 minutes it turns off. So I said, let's use it three times a day. Now, if that's three times a day, and a day is 24 hours, the average usage is 10 minutes, which means that uh, the off time is 1,433 minutes per day. Turning it on, you just press the key. I'm just going to arbitrarily say that's about a half second. On some of the older calculators, that's a substantial amount of current. You turn it on and off a lot, your book holds against it. This may impact your, your, S, your battery life. And then, of course, the auto turn off is 10 minutes, which means the on time is 30 minutes a day. And the running is 15 seconds. Again, that's kind of an arbitrary number. So that's 0.25 minutes per day that the machine is running. So now I have a 24-hour period, and I can figure the percentage of those 24-hour periods that each of those states apply. So then I look, took a look at the data, and I, I used a, an unweighted average. I simply multiplied the four currents together. Now here, um, some machines uh, were, were applicable, especially the business machines down here. And so I decided, and of course it's 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 just simply a, the product of the three measured of the four three or four measured currents. Well, then I did the weighted product, and based on my schedule, my my estimated schedule. So then I have a weighted value, and these are relative numbers. And then I have the four weighted and the three weighted and I have a ratio and I picked the lowest one and I figured like here's uh, three weighted ratio is the one that makes the most sense. This is the reference to the lowest one and everything else is so many times larger than that. And 412x on well, the print calc. And I think this is a quick calc. So the quick calc is the most efficient. I think 35, uh, yeah 35s is on here. That's Well, the office calc. Well, the office calc is uh, a large <laughs> display, and a lot of that current is due to the current. And I have these numbers in the paper that I have. If the display shows all ones or all eights, and what's the difference between them? These comments are the same as the other table. Okay, and using the data, we can diagnose the calculator partially. We can know the keyboard is working because we can press the key and we can see a change on the current. The microprocessor is working. We can estimate the battery life, which is difficult. And I just give a few factors here. One, we need to know the cutoff voltage. I said the classic is one third. So if you buy it new and it's so many volts, you start drawing current from it, it drops down to one, you know, taking drops down to two thirds of the initial value. That's the end of life of the battery. But HP doesn't tell us what the, what the end of their battery life is. What, what have they designed their circuits to work to? We don't know that. So they don't know. Most cases. Oh, that's right. It's, I, I'm, not, I'm not complaining to HP about that. You, you go to the battery manufacturers, and you see, well, I got A, B, C companies making these batteries. They give all different numbers. They have different processes. They made their measurements differently. There's no universal standard. The schedule is undefined. Well, I attempted to give a schedule, which I could say under this schedule, I could give you some correction numbers. Operating conditions, temperature. Do you realize that the, am I out of time already? Yeah, 15 minutes ago. Uh, dryness. If I store my batteries in Arizona, and you store them here in Nashville, well, Gene's batteries are gonna last longer than mine. Because the, the biggest single factor, other than shorting them out and taking all the juice out, is the environmental conditions. And the initial cell conditions, well most people don't realize that if I buy a battery, a cell, from the manufacturer, don't touch it until you're ready to use it. Well, I'm going to test this battery. The moment you start completing that circuit, you start the chemical reactions and that point on, you're going to be 
started to measure your battery life, whether you use it or not. And the supplier, uh, supply chain, the factory makes it, they distribute it throughout the world, and you have no idea where it's been, how it's gone, all that type of thing. So there, there's a lot of factors that, that, that influence it. Okay, suitable digital multimeter. This is the one uh, that I use. It's from Harbor Freight. It's a national uh, tool chain store. How many people have never been in a Harbor Freight store? Oh, a few, oh, a third at least. Uh, it's, a, it's a weird store. It's an unusual store. Once you get to know it, uh, I went. Somebody told me what great a store it was, and I went down. And I looked at it. And I went the second time, and then I then I began to understand how they operate. They have sales. The price will drop down by half, from ten bucks to, to five bucks. Then they'll have a super sale every now and then, and they'll be three dollars. Then they'll have a coupon. If you go in there and sign up, they'll send you the, they're always having promotions. I mean, this is, the, the, the guy who figures this out is a full-time job because he's producing a sale you know, all the time. And you can get them free. So this is September, since the 1st of August to Labor Day, because they had a Labor Day sale, I've got four meters free. And I have two dozen of them at home. And I, in my pop pile, I have about, about five. You can't put... 2 kV on the 1 kV range. It, it doesn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's got a hardware on off switch. And it has a hardware on. Oh, the other thing, and it's very important. This does not have an auto shut off. Yeah. So you leave it on, you come back three days later, chances are that 9 volt battery, which is what it requires, is going to be dead. Very disappointing. I cringe at 9 volt batteries. I don't know why I don't like 9 volt batteries. Expensive and that. I've got one of those too. Does, it, does the battery testing uh, section of the dial, does that do actually do it under load? Uh, uh, battery, uh, oh wait. There's a, there is a battery check. Well, this is the seventh function. There are different models, you have to be careful. The one that you had a picture of, I think, is the, had, a, um, had, a sec, uh, had a dial setting for... Richard, yeah, uh, FYI, we're way over time at the moment. Oh, okay, well. All right, I'm, we'll I'm almost done here. I, I don't know, Roger, and I, I, I thought I would, would see it here, but I don't. But uh, the manual that came with it should should give you that information. Uh oh. Conclusions: Measuring HP calc occurs mostly a mechanical challenge. Knowing the current as aids of what's understanding. Uh, you estimate battery life. The, the digital multimeter is really low cost, so it's well worthwhile for you to play with one. Current values are on the internet. You go on the internet and find out, you know, what model you've got. Somebody has made some measurements, uh, and you can get some idea, and that's what you need. And of course, uh, the HP Solve issues will have that information. And what I did with the, uh, the HP 10, I used a popsicle stick on the back side. You can't see it. I took another 14 wire and I flattened it out. This was heat shrink tubing, so this wire makes the connection on the bottom, and the hook wire makes it here, and I can measure my power in that way. Any questions? Okay, I'll skip the demonstration. I'll leave it set up so maybe you're going to break somebody's interest. Sure. Okay, thank you.